All right. Hey, so we are moving on to Philippi tonight. The book of Philippians. Um, so this is a book of joy, actually. Isn't that good, right? Amen. It's actually the word joy. Paul uses it nine, over 19 times, 19 times in this uh, four chapters that we're going to look at here. And um, a little background about Philippi. It's an interesting little town, actually. And, and it was the first church established in Europe, the first Western church that would ultimately lead to this West. Amen. Um, Philippi started not being called Philippi way back in like three, 356 or so B.C., as a mining town, or mining gold and whatnot, and uh, what happened was, it was named after Philip too of Macedon, and he was the daddy of Alexander the Great. Interesting, huh? But then Rome came along, and all hell broke loose and all that, and it became a Roman province, and so um, somewhere around the 40-ish BC, um, Julius Caesar, remember? got knifed, and um, it was, uh, there was a civil war that, that jumped off. Remember Mark Anthony, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony, and all this, well, before Cleopatra, Mark Anthony and Octavian, who was also known as Augustus, that would go on to be Caesar Augustus, chased after Brutus and Cassius, who actually assassinated Julius Caesar, and there was a big battle there, and Octavian went one way, and Mark Anthony went another way, after Brutus, and so Cassius and Octavian were going at it, and Octavian was actually getting his butt kicked, but Cassius thought he wasn't, and so he killed himself. Yeah, and then once Brutus saw that, he grabbed all his army, but by then Mark Anthony and Octavian were coming down on him, so then Brutus offed himself too. I know, right? Just love the Greek tragedy here. Nonetheless, actually, Mark Anthony killed himself, too, eventually, over the whole Cleopatra thing. Just a, yeah, I mean, Shakespeare could probably write a whole thing about it. But anyway, around 42-ish, or not 42, probably 52, about 20 years after Jesus had died and went resurrected, um, Paul had gone there to preach the gospel. By that time, Philippi had turned into a, a veterans of that war, the Battle of Philippi, a lot of the veterans had moved there kind of like a veterans colony, you know, like a retirement colony, big giant retirement colony, and, and other colonists came there as well. And Paul went there and preached the gospel, and the church of Philippi was established then. And so it became an amazing, powerful church. And where we're at right now is about 11 years after that had happened. So when we go back after we're done with the epistles, we're going to go back through the book of Acts because we can come back and reference all these epistles that we've been going through for the last year or so, however long we've been doing it. And this will be one of them in here because in the epistles is the great story of Paul uh, driving out a demon of a girl that, that these people, these guys were kind of using as a slave and caused a riot and ended up in jail, and they beat him up and all kinds of crazy stuff. But then if you read the whole story in the book of Acts, you find out that the next morning, those guys flipped up because they found out that Paul was a Roman citizen, and you're not allowed to beat up Roman citizens without a trial. Oh, yeah, they were in big trouble, and they apologized, but Paul made them apologize publicly. I love Paul, yeah. And uh, off they went. It's uh, this is great stories, man. But when we get to that part in the book of Acts, it's around the 10th chapter, so it will probably be well within a year before we ever get to that one again. But nonetheless, here we are in Philippi now. So Paul is chained to a Roman guard in Rome. He didn't have a whole lot more time to go. He's pretty much, he's an older fellow by now, and Nero's really wanting to take off his head. Nero's cheese had slid way off his cracker by this time as, as he's writing this letter to the... Look, you guys understand about Nero. He was a brilliant guy. He was actually really smart, and he was a good administrator when he became um, the Caesar, uh, Caesar Nero. But somewhere along the line, something happened to that homeboy, and he got crazy, man. Did you know that he would dip Christians in wax and light them in his garden and ride around in a chariot naked? 
singing out, they burn, they burn, or they light the night, they light the night, just weird stuff like that. And then, of course, the burning of rum, the fiddling and all that jazz. So by this time, Nero was pretty much crazy and uh, decided to end Paul's life. So we have a couple more books to go before Paul actually is uh, beheaded. So right now, though, if you can picture a really dank, dripping, smelly, stuffy cell somewhere with nothing like the nice ones we go to jail in now. Okay, this is like, you know, what you would see in some medieval movie or something like that. And, and being chained to a guard as well so that you couldn't escape. And, and needless to say, you got to know, if you were the guard, would you want to be chained in that situation? No. no, so you probably would be none too fun to live with, would you? No. So nothing was good in Paul's life at that moment. And then we have the book of Philippians. That's the context of what he's writing, and it's going to amaze you at Paul's joy in all that. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord. As we break open this book of Philippians, we invite your Holy Spirit now to, to, to just break it down for us, Father, so we can understand all that you have for us in this book, Father. And it's such an amazing book, Lord. We ask your Holy Spirit to slow us down and let us just take in everything you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen? Here's your opening. In your church family, how important are words of affirmation? Very important, huh? Everybody wants to know they're, they're loved and needed and thought about and remembered and doing good stuff, you know, complimented, things like that. You know, words of affirmation go a lot farther than words that are hostile. Do you know that? They actually are, are very powerful and uplifting. So look how Paul starts off his letter. He says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, bought and paid for, bought by the blood, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So this church had been established now for 11 years. They had levels of leadership. And, of course, you know, it wasn't, um, this wasn't necessarily, um, it was, it was, directed at everybody in the church, but these guys were the ones that were the overseers. That's what those fancy words mean right there. Deacon literally means table server. You know, that was uh, something that was established um, by the apostles that you know, we get these guys that can go deal with the people, you know, and their, their problems or issues and things they need so that we can go on to do the administrative work of planting churches and all that. So that's where the whole deacon thing came along. And I think sometimes in America, um, people get elevated to positions and their heads swell. And if they would take a minute and actually understand what the position is, they would realize that they had just got demoted in the church from the world's perspective. But from God's perspective, they've been, they were given a raise to servant. Amen? Um, we, we do things a lot here in America that are, that's really weird. Bishop it was literally an overseer of a church, kind of like uh, like our chaplains maybe, something like that. But boy, have they been elevated, huh? And over the years, their hats just kept getting more and more elevated, didn't they? <laughs> boy, I read a crazy one about that, but I'm not going to share it with you. Anyway, check, what, check out what he says now. Remember where Paul is right now, locked in a prison, horrible food, sanitation, you know, I don't even know if they got a bucket in their cell. There's really no telling how bad it might have been. And look what he says to him: Grace and peace, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he opened his letter so much like that. And, and I know that gets blown over really quick, but, but we have to look at one little thing here that I shared before, that the peace doesn't come until the grace does. Grace always comes first before peace. And I know that because personally in my own life, I had no peace until I had grace from God. Amen? Amen. And, and the way he broke it down here, though, is really kind of cool. And I wouldn't go as far as saying cryptic, but it's kind of cool. He says, grace to you and peace from God. Grace comes from who? God Almighty. God, by the grace of God, we're saved. But look at where does the peace come from? Jesus Christ. When we receive him as our Lord and Savior, his Holy Spirit comes upon us. It's just, it's not anything really cryptic at all. It's just kind of cool the way he breaks it down, grace and peace, because we come, to, we come to God, man. We have to have a moment where we come to God and we're like, Lord, we need your son as Savior. And when Jesus comes into our life, 
that peace that surpasses all, all understanding takes over. And we can navigate through stuff where before we were just like those, those little twirling Turkish dudes. The turban dude? I don't know. Okay. Whirling turbans? Okay. That sounds like a pastry, but nonetheless, anyway, the dudes that spin around, you know, and they just keep spinning and stuff like that. I'm impressed by it. They do that stuff for hours, man. I'd be like four spins in, and I'd be down for the count, man, on the ground. So coming to Christ, though, we stop all that nonsense and all that spinning, don't we? All of a sudden, we start, we start falling in love with the Word, and we start seeing how he, he wants to change us, and he gives us opportunities to change what we were into something that he wants us to be, something that he sees that we can't even conceive with our own mind because we're kind of been trapped in that spot. And then we come out of this, this honeymoon stage, and we're a new creation, and all of a sudden everything looks different. And we just, from that point on, until he calls us home, we just make good choice after good choice after good choice, right? Okay. We make a lot of good choices, though, don't we? We start walking with the Lord. Things change. It, it's part of, you know, and, and, and it's crazy, man. You know, before I got saved, because I got saved when I was 36 years old, and you know what? I'd never had a checking account in my life at 36 years old. I never had a checking account. They took my driver's license when I was 15 because I was just, I was an unlucky driver, I guess. I know, right? I'd never actually paid a bill, like, like had lights or, well, I mean, I had lights in my name, but they were only my name for a short time, and then they went into other people's names, which is another Bible study. But when I got saved, I met Manny, Manny Arrieta right down the road here, and I went to work for him building hot rods for him, and he taught me how to balance a checkbook and get all my utilities turned on, make my car payments on time, all this stuff that I should have known by the time I was 36 years old, but before that, I had no desire or conception to, to learn any of that stuff because it was a day-to-day-to-day-to-day thing. We just lived day-to-day. -day. And if you woke up the next morning, you went on with the day, right? We did whatever we did and moved on. So I saw in my own personal life, and that's kind of a worldly version of it, but nonetheless, that's my miracle, you know, that I was able to start learning how to be a man, learning how to be a father at 36 years old. And it was all because of the blood of Christ. It never would have happened without Christ. Had I not met Christ, I probably wouldn't have made 37 or 38 years old, I don't think anyway, at that point in my life right there. So when we're looking at the things that are going on in our life, and we were kind of talking about that last week too at the end of uh, Ephesians when you know Paul was chained and, and he, was, he was able to find the good in that that guy that he was chained to he shared the gospel with the dude. And, and we learned that, you know, some of the things that, that we're chained to in life, we can, we can bring Jesus into it and make it better and improve upon it. But, we gotta, but when we do that, we have to agree with him up front that when we, whatever the situation is in our life that we're chained to, and they're never, we're never really chained to good stuff, by the way. Have you ever noticed that? It's always bad stuff that's going on. But if we agree with him that, that we'll show up to the party, he'll do things in, in the most bad situations and turn them into some of the most beautiful things that you've ever had in your life. Sometimes they become something. Sometimes they go away. But we have to be willing to come in to that whole deal going, whatever your will, that's what will be done. Even if I don't want it that way, um, I'm going to trust you. And, you know, sometimes he does some great miracles in all that stuff. And other times, we get broken hearts. You know, we, we get hurt sometimes. But on the other side of that, there's always some amazing thing that makes us go, I could have had a V8. Why did I wait this long, man, before I finally came to this point and stopped being such a dope? Look at what was waiting for me all this time. But in the, in the economy of God, there's never wasted time. All the stuff that we do, he will use every little bit of it. Amen? Yeah. Maybe not on you, but certainly on people around. So here's Paul in this horrible place. You know, my letter would have 
probably started like, this sucks, exclamation point, all right? And that would have been the tone, if you will, <laughs> of the letter, right? But he's not. He's like, grace and peace to you, man. He's like, I got lots of grace and I got lots of peace. You know, I'm chained to this dude, but nonetheless, why, why would Paul have such grace and peace? Because you know what Paul knew? It's something that we would all do well to learn and get through our thick skulls is that wherever you are is exactly where God wants you to be. And Paul was right there. As, as he's talking about all this stuff, he's preaching the gospel inside that jail. So not only are, are the guards that are around him being saved and the prisoners are giving their life to Christ, but that's spreading outward from, from where Paul is too. And, and he's, what his job now is, is to write letters of encouragement and correction to the churches that he established. He knew he was getting ready to die. It wasn't like, uh, like a big secret why he was there. He was, he was brought there for that reason. So he's kind of coming into the, the glide slope of life, if you will, and what he sees of his legacy, what he, what he accomplished in his time with Christ was good. Just like when you go back to the very beginning of creation, when God created light and God created the trees and the animals and all that stuff, and, and you read these words that he says, and he saw that it was good, and he enjoyed it. Now, for us, the challenge as a Christian and coming to church, you know, um, isn't, it's not a social thing. I know, I know we all hang out and stuff like that, but it's about edification and, and growing up in the Lord, becoming mature. And, and we have to all, from time to time, look, just stop and look at our Christian walk, our Christian career, if you will. And if you were at the very twilight of your life right now, would you be able to look back with the same joy and happiness that Paul has based on what you've done for the king? I'm not talking about what you did before Christ, all right? Everybody's got a story before Christ made us who we are. That's why we're able to preach the way we preach and share the way we share. But on the other side of salvation, what have we done to really plug in as believers, men and women of God, when we gave our life to Christ? Because sometimes it's very one-sided, and I think that's where we get screwed up. Because we go, we get saved, we got our fire insurance, we're not going to hell. Far out, I feel great. That's only half of it. The other half of it, we've now committed our entire life to God to Jesus Christ. And I think that's where we fall short, where we kind of leave, we kind of forget about that part that now we've, we've given our life to Christ. We have been saved. We, we're our names written in the Lamb Book of Life. But from this point on, we're to live at, to Christ, to live to Christ and die in his gain. We're going to get to that stuff here in this book as well. Paul has lived such a great life. And the coolest thing about it is even though he knows he's getting close to death here as we're reading through this, he's still promoting and building and edifying and lifting up the church of Christ. And that just gives him great joy. So we have to question ourselves. What are we, what are we using to bring us joy? Is it the word or promoting Jesus Christ, going out and sharing our faith, praying with people? Or are we still turning to the things of the world to fulfill certain things in our life? Because it's a, it's a roadblock, man. There's so much more available, but we get stuck on stupid, and it is stupid. It's actually stupid cubed. Do you know what that is? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Three stupid. Because we know he's already shown us, and it's right in front of our face. Does that make sense? Made so much sense in my head right now. Didn't quite as it came out of my mouth. That's really weird. You know, I would give anything if I could plug you guys into my head for just one service. <laughs> Come on. I supply the skis. Don't worry. Look what he says here now. So put yourselves in a dark, dank cell. People moaning. People crying. Probably people screaming, no doubt. Some of the brutality that was going on. Large sweaty, angry men screaming at you and throwing stuff at you. And when it's time to eat, who knows what slop is being thrown to the floor so you can eat it like an animal, right? How would you feel right now, even as a believer, all right? Even as a believer, well, that would never happen. This is only biblical stuff, right? Ah, 
Take a trip to China sometime or anywhere in the Middle East and many other countries around the world. That's exactly how Christians are being treated right now as we're in this nice little building right here. It's happening all over the place. But look at how Paul, what, what was on Paul's mind here. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He hadn't been there for 11 years, man. Well, the church was established 11 years. I'm sure that he had gone. All he, what was on his mind was his brothers and sisters in Philippi at this moment right here, the Philippian church. And he's going, man, I thank God every time I think of you guys. I can look around at this guard that's actually kind of cool because we've become friends now and I've been sharing Jesus with him for like a year, you know. They're probably going to cut his head off too. Did you know that happened? I don't know if you guys know that or not, but there was a, a game. They were always playing games with Christians, you know, horrible, you know, like make a chew toy out of a Christian in a bag and let a bear, you know, chomp on them and stuff. But one of the things they did was put them on a frozen lake without any clothes, and they would throw water on them and make them stand there in that lake. And around the lake, they would build these bonfires, and they would mock them and go, hey, Give up on that Jesus. He's not going to save you. Come to the fire and be warm. And they'd be in their freezing and periodically they'd go out and throw more water on them. So they would just freeze out there. And there was one, one story that I read in Jesus Freaks. Voice of the Martyrs, uh, Roman soldiers couldn't take it anymore because they wouldn't give up. They kept praying and singing psalms. And he said, that's it. I'm going. And he ran out there and joined them. So it happens, man. There's a lot of times we read right in the Word, and we'll read that in Acts as well. I think it might be in Philippians. Well, I think it happened in Philippi. Anyway, where the earthquake happened, remember that? And the, the cell doors opened, and the jailer came out, and he thought everyone escaped, and he was going to... They were really big on suicide, you know. In fact, for, uh, for you guys that are going on uh, Thursday night, I read that whole study, and it's pretty dang awesome. And Paul does talk about suicide. And a uh, very interesting subject and, and verses that go with it. But anyway, that dude ended up, Paul's like, oi, don't kill yourself, man. We're all here. And that dude ended up taking him to his house and dressed their wounds, which in, insinuated they were getting beaten up and whipped and all kinds of other horrible stuff. And his whole family got saved. So even in the worst of situations that we find ourselves in, the grace of God is right there, man, because we are children of the Most High God. And we have everything that we need to share with people in those moments if we could stink and step out of our own selves for a second and focus on what God's calling us to do. So he goes, always in every prayer of mine making requests for you all with joy. First time we heard the word joy in here. We're going to hear it a lot in there. He talks about being in that dank, dark cell, remembering all of you and just thinking, man, that Justin, he's a weird one, but I love him, man. I miss him. Yeah, he's just like, bing, 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 bing sometimes. And then you put him and him and Curtis together, and it's like pinball. Ding, 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 ding. I love those guys, man. I miss them so much, and I think when I pray with them, it gives me joy to pray for all of them. What love that is right there from this amazing man, Paul. He had every reason to be angry or sad or in despair, or depressed, but he wasn't. He wasn't at all. In fact, that was probably tripping them all out. I was like, how is this guy so happy? How is he so joyful in this situation? But it's infectious. Just as much as being a bonehead is infectious, so is joyfulness around other people. And you all know exactly what I'm talking about. You can, you can be having a great day and walk up to one person and just like, what? Like just falling into a tar pit, man. Just hang out down there with the saber-toothed lions and stuff. Were they lions or tigers? Whatever. I like lions better. But anyway, my story, okay? And on the other hand, you can just be having kind of a ho hum drum day, and you could encounter someone that's just like joyful, man, happy, 
and it's, they're just beaming, and it's contagious, man. All of a sudden, you start feeling better yourself. That's the whole point. You know, as Paul's talking about all this stuff, and he's telling them how much he loves them, how much he misses them, how much he prays for them, and how much joy it brings them. As they're reading this letter, knowing where he's at, by the way, it's not a big secret where Paul was, and they're reading this letter to their congregation. Imagine how that would have made them feel, that congregation. Maybe expecting a letter like, man, they whip me every day. You know, and I'll just be asleep, and they, they wake me up with a guard clobbering me with a club, and that's how they wake me up. That might have been the letter they were expecting, but that was not the letter that Paul gave them. Why is that? What is it about this guy that's willing to, to not bring all the, the dread down on someone else and pour it? It's like you can almost sometimes with people, you can almost hear like the beep, beep sound as they're backing the truck up to you. They're beep, beep, and they just dump their whole load of BS on your head. And then they kind of drive away. They feel lighter and happier. Like, well, I'm glad you feel better. Puh, I hate maneuver. And you got to dig yourself out of all that stuff. Well, Paul was a prisoner. He wasn't going anywhere, first of all. And, and he had a mission that he was fulfilling inside the prison and by the, the letters that he was writing out. But what he knew was this. The, Philippian, the, the church in Philippi was ministering big time in Philippi. There was a lot of stuff happening there. The last thing he wanted to do was throw a boat anchor in the water and stop that forward movement because Paul lived for Christ. That was Paul's life, was Christ. And so this joy that he's talking about here, it's not fake. This is absolute truth. He goes, look, for making a request and all you... For all of you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. This is such a great line, it's a great verse right here. He's going, I remember you guys from the very beginning, man. I remember when Crusher walked through the door, man. I remember all this stuff. I remember Red Dawn and Riverside Harley Davidson. We took the battle wagon out there, man. I remember that stuff too. But Paul was remembering. You know, and now they're, you know, they're, ten, they're a decade older now. Some of them are bishops. Some of them are deacons. They become leaders in the church because they're still there, man. And they're still serving. They got the vision and they ran with the vision. He's going, man, I am so joyful that we're all still together in the gospel. And I remember every single one of you. And it brings me such joy. It's, it's a father thing. It, I mean, not biological, but when that church was planted, he became the church father. And, and he traveled all around to the other churches and things that he did, just like a dad. You know, we, we went through, we've been through the epistles, you know, in First Corinthians. He was that kid that you just want to slap silly, right, for Second Corinthians. But they worked all that stuff out. And then we saw stuff in Galatians. We saw stuff in Ephesians. You know, the, it's welcome to humanity. But this church, this church was rocking, and it brought him great joy to know that. He goes, look, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He was absolutely certain that the work that was happening in Philippi was because of this good work that was started, like in each and every one of us in this room right now that know Jesus the Savior. We gave our life to Christ. That day the work began. The good work began. And we changed, right? I, I know that I know we, we still carry a lot of the flesh, and we carry a lot of stuff that, that we had in our, our past, but much also changed and was left in our past, and this new creation started coming out, where the rage went away. Anybody ever struggle with rage in here? Anybody have bad tempers that were, like, horrible, that are somewhat under control now, or rather not as prevalent anymore? How do you think that happened? You didn't pull it off before Christ. You were a lunatic. And everybody that knew you will confirm, yes, you were crazy. You were nuts. What happened to you, man? Why are you so nice now? You know, you, like the guy that went around with the ice pick, stabbing people in the eyes and stuff like that. Now you just want to pray with people. What happened to you? Well, great opportunity right there to tell them what. Jesus Christ happened to me, man. That's what happened to me. I've grown in the Lord, and I'm continuing to grow. And he's going, look. I'm confident of this very thing, that that's going to continue on, and, and it's not going to stop. You know, you know what's crazy about that is that um, the idea of, of 
this good work being completed, we, we have a part to play in that as well. Otherwise, we'd just be programmable robots, right? Or God could just go beep, 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 and all of a sudden you're like, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That would be boring, right? No, man, we got to show up, and what that means is the, there, there's a calling to go in this direction right there, and, and the flesh is still pulling us over in this direction. At some point, we got to grow up, grow up, and go, you know what? That's never worked out, you know? It might be fun for a minute, but it's never worked out. But the things that I've been doing in Christ never don't work out. Do you, you, like, you use your brain at some point. I know that some of us here have diminished cellular activity. I understand that. It's a miracle that most of us can even talk in this room. But we can weigh the pros and cons, all right? It's not really horticulture. If you're banging your head against a wall, and all you need to do is take one step to the right, and then you can pass the wall, wouldn't it behoove us to quit banging our head into the wall and take a step to the right and go around the wall and get on with whatever the calling is? But sometimes we're just determined to keep smashing our face into that wall, aren't we? Well, Paul's going, look, this good work that started in you isn't supposed to stop at that wall. Yes, there's going to be obstacles, man, and, and you'd be foolish to, to think that there's not going to be problems that come up and obstacles and temptations and things of that nature. Good Lord, we're on the earth still. We're not even of this world anymore. We're aliens now, and this world... Here's, this is going to be a head freeze for some of you. This world doesn't like you. I know. Like, everybody likes me. No, no. Not everybody likes you. <laughs> and some of you, well, never mind. No, man. Principalities, powers, rulers of the air, the darkness, man. Rulers in high places, spirits, all that stuff, man. They're out to get you. They are definitely out to get you. And on top of that, we have our own stinking sinful nature we got to encounter. That's why the Bible is so vitally important to us. It's not just, okay, and look, let me share something about the Bible, too. This is not a Band-Aid against sin. Amen? You can't just read the Bible and go, okay, well, no, I'm not, I'm not sinning right now. Well, as long as I read the Bible, I'm not sinning. But as soon as I close the Bible, whoa, 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 whoa it's on. Okay, well, you're, you're not, you're using the Bible, just as, as you might use a drug or something like that. The, the power of the Bible is the washing of the word, just like we're talking about right now. And you're like, well, well, I don't even understand what the wash of the word means. Well, we just talked about a little bit right there that Paul says, hey, that good work that God, that, that Jesus started in you, let it continue to grow until the day he calls you home. Is that complicated? It's not complicated at all, is it? So, well, what the heck am I supposed to do with it then? Well, look, he goes, just as it is right for me to think this is, is, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as I'm in chains. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. I, I know, as, as confident I am of this chain that's wrapped around my ankle and hooked to that guard right there, He's going, I have you in my heart. Uh, you, you mean, you, mean you, you are real to me. You're, you're not just like faces in a crowd or something like that. Every single one of you are in my heart. And, and imagine now whose heart you're in out there in the world. People that you may have encountered, shared your faith with, prayed with. And, you know, for us, it's a, it's a one and done. You meet someone out on the road, you pray with them and stuff like that, and off they go. And little do you know that you're now in their heart for the rest of your life. I seriously doubt that Don Overstreet knew how important he was to me. I mean, we were friends and everything. Uh, he's a great man, and uh, he's gone home to be with the Lord now. But I don't know that he really understands how important that day was in July of 1996 when he came to Pomona, California, and scooped me up off of that street right there and took me off into Cabazon and dropped me off in the desert. Thank God he dropped me off in the desert, man. If, if there had been somewhere close to get to, I'd have escaped, but, you know. That was the worst jail I've ever been in. You know why? Because the gate wasn't locked. And I literally, I'm not even kind of kidding you guys. I, there was a post where the gate, they had a gate, but it was never closed. And I would hold on to the post, and I'd have one foot in the ranch 
and one foot outside the ranch. And I'd be staring at those dinosaurs. And they're like five, how far? They're far away, huh? They're pretty far. And I was there in the summer, so you could see the heat, little heat waves going like in an old Western movie. And the coyotes and the wolves, oh! I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get eaten, man. I'm going to gas out halfway there, man, and wake up. There'll be none on my arm. So I didn't go. And that was cool because that was all God's plan. Because it took about a month of all that to where I finally fell in love with the Lord out there. Then I never wanted to leave. I wanted to stay there forever. And I probably would have, too. I loved it. It was safe. It was home. It was God. And, and I was learning the word, man. And I was just like, like went over a waterfall of the word, man. Because we didn't have nothing but Bibles. We weren't allowed to have calendars, newspapers, nothing. Only the Bible back in those days. It was all we had. So that's all we read. And as soon as I did, as soon as I went over the falls, I'm like, I'm here forever, man. I'm going to be like an overseer. I'm going to be like the big kahuna, whatever they want to call me here. I'm going to stay forever. They're like, okay, you're going to plant a church. I'm like, yay, that's awesome. Here we come, Tahiti, set free Bali. Yeah, set free Burdu. I'm like, that's so funny. It almost sounded like you just said Burdu instead of <laughs> Bali. Like my ears aren't working right. I couldn't, I really couldn't at that, in that moment, understand why they would want to put a church here. This is like the armpit of the world I'd been through here. I'm like, that's not a place for a church. See, I was still a baby Christian, and I was thinking building, you know? Like, why would you put a really nice place like that in a place like Purdue? And uh, it wasn't long after, you know, the tree came in, Pastor Tree, you know, we met him, and that honestly at the moment didn't help to be honest with you, when I first time I met Tree, but he was a very large, scary biker, and he showed us some stuff out there about being bold and just stepping out in faith, and it took a very short amount of time for me to understand exactly why God brought me to Purdue, because he pulled me out of Pomona, and I could speak these people's language. <laughs> we could talk. There wasn't anything that was going on in Purdue that I, had already, I hadn't already seen in the desert or in Pomona or in El Monte. There was nothing that was here that was like, I'm terrified of that. There was nothing. And I understood at that moment, now what I need to do is learn to share the word of God. And, and so we did. That's what we did. And the church was established, and here we are now, almost 30 years later, at the roadhouse. Amen? So, hallelujah. But check this out. When he's talking about this, though, he reminds them, and I love the way Paul did this. He says, you are all partakers with me of grace. I'm not the big kahuna here. We're all under the same grace of God, amen? We're all children of the Most High God. God calls some to be apostles, some to be administrators, some to be pastors, and on and on and on and on and on. That's what God does. He calls people according to the gifts that he gives them, right? But that doesn't mean that anybody is elevated. And sometimes in America, we get that so screwed up that we put pastors on the highest, po the, these big old, what do you call those things, podiums or pedestals? And it's a thinking long way down, man. And I'll tell you what, they got the same sinful nature that all of us have, amen? And it, it's already, to be, to be a pastor, I'll tell you right now, um, I know that there's a lot of people that aspire to be a pastor, and that's really cool. You know, I'm, I'm not against that. But there's so much more involved than this right here. This is like fun time right here. This is like pastor, you know, gone wild. And that's probably not a good. It's fun time, all right? It's, it's all the other hours of study, you know, so you can kind of do your job right. But dealing with people and other things that go on, and I'm not complaining about it. I love it. This is absolutely like the, the perfect job for me. I, I really dig it. But it's not what a lot of people think it's cracked up to be. And you know the, the rate of pastor suicide is astronomical. It's crazy, man, how these guys, um, they can't, they, they get elevated to the, and, and they know who they are. They're, he's just still a man, man. And uh, they make some really poor decisions, man. And um, it's tragic to me. It truly is. Um, the hot ticket for anything that we do in the service of Jesus 
if, if I can give you advice from my own personal life, be humble. Humble yourself before the Lord, man. In due time, he'll lift you up to whatever he wants you to be. Amen? Be, one of, be a spoke in the wheel. That was such a good Bible study, man, the wheel theology. And we lost it, the, lost the CD, and I can't remember what I said. Because <laughs> it was like back in 2013. Anyway, check this out. He goes, for God is my witness how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. God, I miss you guys. I think about you all the time. You're in my heart. You bring me great joy. Just to hug you one more time. God is my witness how much I miss you. But I'm certainly grateful that you're continuing to do what you're doing, and I'm exactly where God wants me to be right now. But don't ever think for a minute that I forgot about you guys. I think about you all the time. And I get reports. And he goes, look, he says, and, and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. He wants them to continue, even though they're doing good, all right? He wants them to continue to grow. There's a thing about love, and, and not, not like the love between a man and a woman, which is the only right one <laughs> anyway. The love of Christ that's within us, it changes us. And see, that's what we got to get tonight. If we get anything from Paul tonight, is the love of Christ in our hearts. For real. Not just, I'm a Christian, stab Christian, boom, I'm a Christian. But from the innermost inner of inners of you, this is where it begins. That love that flows like a fountain is what the Bible says. And the reason is, is because that love draws us near to God. It draws us to him, not away from him. It, it's actually changed. You know, when we're talking about, you know, here, your new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. The new is the love of Christ in us. Not just the love of Christ at the right hand of God, because that's where he is, and he loves me from there. No, the love of Christ is within us now. There's a reason for it. Why is the love of Christ in us? Because we're here with a bunch of stinking, lost, and broken people all around us. And we need to share that love of Christ now with a lost and broken world, right? Well, if we don't have it yet, if we haven't got it, like, from our head to our heart yet, we're missing a whole bunch of the good stuff. Like, like this, check it out. As he's, as he's talking right here, he goes, look. Blah, 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 blah. I pray that the love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. What does that mean right there? That love of Christ that's within us, it draws us to his word. And we fall in love with his word. The more we fall in love with his word, the more we fill with his love. And then the more we want to fall in love with his word. And it just starts this thing. Well, what happens is all of a sudden we change our perspective on things, the way we look at stuff. Before Christ, we could look at someone and boom, just sock him in the face. You're like, you just had a sock me face. I don't even know you, but boom, I felt like hitting you. What's wrong with you, dude? I don't know. Your loss is what's wrong with you. Now, all of a sudden, that same person comes up 10 years later. You're saved. You walk up to them, and they're like, ah. You're like, no, no, brother. I want to pray with you now. And they're like, what are you up to? Nothing, man. Yeah, liar. No. Psych! Boom! No. <laughs> We have a knowledge now, by falling in love with the word, a knowledge of other things. We start to perceive life differently. We see things differently. We see it through the love of Christ now. You know what else love does? It, as much as it draws us to God, you know, and the word tells us, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you, right? Okay, as that love that I'm talking about, this is the love of Christ, draws us near him into his word. It also draws us away from the things that separate us from him. That's the discernment part. The knowledge is falling in love with the word. And we're like, man, I can't get enough of this word. I mean, it's not just reading it technically like a ritualistic thing, man. No, man, it's like, it's like I feel it absorbing into my soul, man. Things are changing. This stuff's in my, in my mind. It's written on the tablets of my heart. Well, I don't know too many verses. I doubt that. I really believe that you, you people in here have more knowledge of the Word of God than you can even imagine, man. If you would just step out of the way of pride, fear, blah, 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 all the things that humanity does, and just start sharing the Word of God, you will start rattling. They may not be verbatim, amen, but you know what? You'll be sharing the Word of God on things that you've been reading and studying, and they're, they're all part of you. That's the love of Christ that starts to flow. That's the light that you can't hide under a basket. You can go out there and try to be a faker, 
You know, you can try to memorize a bunch of verses and stuff like that. And I'm here to tell you right now, nobody in this room is going to fall for it. They'll, you'll, anybody in this room can pick a faker off a mile away. Am I right or not? You guys know exactly what I'm talking about right here. But when that spirit is true and it's the love of Christ shining on you, that's a whole different ballgame right there. You're like, man, this is a man, this is a woman of God right here, man. I'm going to listen to what they have to say. The other one, you're just like, you've already written that stuff off. Two seconds into the conversation, you're like, eh, eh. Nope, just stop talking right now, man. You know, you you're, ain't falling for that one, the old banana in the tailpipe trick. <sighs> Anybody ever fall for that? <laughs> banana in the tailpipe? <laughs> Don't know what I'm talking about, do you? You will by the end of the night. Okay, so. <laughs> oh, that's what that means. <laughs> I don't have a banana, but potatoes work too. Anyway, old habits gone, okay? Check this out. He goes, I pray that your love may abound, and still more and more in the knowledge and discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ. You can check yourself. This is what the Word of God says. This is where my heart is leading me. This is where my spirit says I need to go. Not over there. This is what he just said, that you may approve the things that are excellent. That's excellent right there, man. We're going down and doing a hospital drive-by, man, and we're going to be going to Route 66, and people are going to be falling out and taking ambulance rides to the hospital. Man, we're going to pray for people. <laughs> Amen? By God. Yeah, and we did. We had a couple of them fall out here. So, Why, though, that you may be sincere and without offense, Till the day of Christ. Offending who? And being sincere to who? Being sincere to the one that saved you from the pit of hell. The one that delivered you from all the junk that was going on in your life. The chaos. Just the bleh, everything that was happening. And set you on a stone so you could start walking in faith, man. And breathe again for the first time. And see the blue sky. And feel like you were alive for the first time in decades, man. Yeah, we need to be sincere and without offense, unto him. Why is it so easy for us to just blatantly slap Jesus in the face while he's on the cross? Oh, I appreciate you saving my soul, Lord, but I'm going to go do that right now. I know that was pretty harsh, wasn't it? Welcome to reality. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. See, Paul is telling these guys, I believe in my heart, you're not going down those roads, man. You guys are doing it all right. You guys are being excellent in a really tough town. Philippi was still a Roman, now it was a Roman province there with all these veterans of these wars, man. These dudes hacked people up with swords and stuff, man. They probably had post-traumatic stress to the max, man. You know, a little bit nutty as well. But here's this church of these young guys, man, and they're just joyfully preaching the word of God. And these guys are just like, you know what? I spent a lifetime killing. And a lot of them probably didn't even want to, just so you know, because the Roman army was well known to capture other people. And if they didn't kill them or turn them into slaves, they made them be soldiers and go out and fight. That's how empires are built, by the way. And these guys are kicking it now in their retirement town going, you know what? These guys are kind of weird. They call themselves a roadhouse or something. I think they're a chariot club or something. I don't know. Not sure. But there's something about them, man. I don't know. They're they're adorable. You know? <laughs> Sometimes I I want to stab one or two of them, but not the most of them though. Most of them are pretty cool, you know? But that Justin and Curtis, man. They're gonna drive me crazy, man. They've seen some horrible stuff in their day, and now these people are sharing joy, happiness, redemption with them and they're just kicking back watching them and absorbing that light and that love that I'm talking about right there and so many got saved in Philippi from this little church right there and Paul's going you guys are rocking the Casbah because the Casbah was behind the church of Philippi in Kashmir I totally made that part up right now <laughs> how many of you went wow I didn't know that yeah it's just a song by the kinks I think but nonetheless he's going be filled with the fruits of righteousness, 
which are by Jesus Christ. What, what were the fruits of the righteous? Remember Galatians 5? We just went through it not too long ago. 522, I think. Was it? Galatians 5, if I remember it. 522, maybe-ish. Let's see, 524, 20. Oh, look, 522. Be the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, right off the bat. Joy, boom, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Why would the Roman guys want to beat up on these guys? They're just bringing the gospel message to them, man, and the church continued to grow. And he's like, that's what you guys are doing. What's that got to do with us? Because you know what, you guys? We need to be like the Philippian church here in San Bernardino. We just prayed our brains out last night and committed and pledged to God. Let the revival start right here in this little church, the church in America. Let them grow some cojones, man, and get out there and start doing some work, right? But for what? Here's the great answer to the for what? To the glory and praise of God. That's why we exist, you guys. I don't know if you've got that yet. Since you gave your life to Christ, we've given our life to Christ for this, to give glory unto God. And listen, man, the moment you try to grab God's glory, you start running into problems, man, in anything. And let me share what I mean by anything. It, we give God glory when things are going good, right? Things are rocking. Like, glory to God, hallelujah. Got a new car, got a new bike, something like that. But can you give glory to God in the tough times? Well, I know you all can say yeah. But do you give glory to God? You got court dates, got job problems, IRS issues, whatever. Can you just sit there and go, glory to God, man? You know why I'm saying that? Because this dude is chained to a dang Roman soldier right now in a dank, dark, ugly cell, and he's given all the glory to God. Look, man, we can, we can dive so deep into this stuff theologically, and we can also look right at it, what it's saying and what it's telling us to do. And Paul's going, look, I'm giving you, now talking to us, not Philippi, all through the millennia, I'm giving you guys a roadmap to joy in your life with Christ. Follow this book, man, right here. These guys, how do we do it right? Start in Philippi, man, and start reading. This is how we do it right. Not really that hard. What godly encouragement can you offer other Christians? Maybe a better question would have been, what godly encouragement do you offer other Christians? Do we take the time to go, hey, man, how you doing? You know, you're really doing a good job. You know, I saw you praying the other day. Right on. And even if it wasn't all that spectacular, you know what? He tried, right? Is that worthy of some love and joy and encouragement right there? You know what? You, you have no idea what you're doing to somebody in that situation. That may have been the very first prayer someone ever prayed, and they were terrified, and they thought they looked like a big old dope in front of everybody. And they're never going to do that again in public. That ain't going to happen. And you come sashaying up, whatever a sashay might be, and you go, hey, man, that was really good. That was cool, man. That was a nice, that was really a beautiful prayer. And all of a sudden, you just unleashed a prayer warrior on the world right there. You have no idea the power you have in encouraging words, as well as discouraging words. Like, dude, you look so stupid right now. Your hands were all wobbling around and stuff, and your eyes were rolling in your head and stuff like that. Everybody was just laughing at you. You think that guy's going to pray again? No. Probably not likely, right? No. We have so much power, but I don't think we truly understand. What positive things can you say about your family in Christ? <laughs> You go out there in the world, and, and someone asks you, so what's that roadhouse about? Oh. Like, <laughs> let me see. Well, they throw axes. <laughs> they got guns hanging in the back. We are the irregular subculture. Amen. Here's the application night. Share the joy of the Lord with someone. Listen, check this out. Share the love of, share the joy of the Lord with someone tonight. Before you leave here, man. Just give someone a hug and go, man, I love you. I think about you and I pray about you. See how it makes you feel as you're wandering out. Then sashay out. There it is, right there. Amen. This whole book, Philippians, is going to be 
Joy, joy, and joy. Who's, who needs joy right now? Does anybody need some joy in their life right now? Hallelujah. It just got delivered to you from God. Amen? It's got a big old shot of joy. Take it. Receive it, man. Absorb it and go, yeah, you know what? I have had a rough, a rough day, but you know what? I'm taking the joy, and I'm running with it tonight. Amen? And before I leave this place, I'm going to spread a little joy with somebody else because not only are they going to feel good, but by golly, I'm going to feel good myself. Amen? Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Lord, in this amazing book as we start here, Father. We do need some joy. It's some tough stuff going on right now, Lord, in our world and the world around us as well, Father. So teach us. Give us the knowledge. Give us the wisdom. Give us the understanding so we can step outside our stinking selves, Father, and just see what you want us to be, what you have for us, and the joy and the fulfillment and the happiness, all that you have in the midst of all of these chains that are around us here, Lord. Father, help us to see to love the way you love us. And tonight our desire is that everybody does know your Son and Savior, Father. As we pray together as a family, Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to move to this room, through the camera, wherever it needs to go, Father. Rededications, whatever it is, Father, let the joy flood this room tonight, Lord, that none of us leave this place the way we walked in that door, Lord. The attacks of the enemy, the enemy are many right now, Father, but you know what? There's joy in the battle, Father, because we're in it with you. If we weren't being jumped, we wouldn't be doing any good for you right now. So we understand that, Father. We ask you to be with us tonight in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father God, I sin against you, Lord, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life, to fill me with your Holy Spirit, and put me on that road that you'll have me travel in Jesus' name. Joy to you all. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. God, I feel so much better. Joy's good, man. You know what, you know what those letters, I read somewhere what those letters were about? J-O-I. How to find joy in your life. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. J-O-I. Interesting, huh? Keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless you guys. There's going to be girls brand over here, guys brand over here. Come on, Christopher. Don't be a circle. Got him. Got him.